All right, is everybody ready to get the uh, work session started? Michael. And and I understand from council member Ott that he'll, he should be here in 10, 15 minutes or yeah, so. Yeah, he was running a little late. Yep. All right, so I'll just do a very, very brief kickoff once again, and then I'll turn it over to Rob. Thanks, thanks all for being here again. This is our third joint work session. Last time when we met, you all directed us to uh, go ahead and start, as I call, papering up the draft regulations, uh, good neighbor guidelines, so on and so forth, so that you all could have something to respond to. We provided this group with an ordinance with some good neighbor guidelines, a checklist for short-term rental owners, and you all had several days to look at that. And so we uh, are going to consider that uh, a straw man for everyone to respond to tonight. We hope that that's a good starting point, and it is just that, a starting point. Uh, we as staff took back what we heard from you all last time we met, and we put that into the relevant documents. And um, from there, it's, it's yours to continue marking up however you wish. The, uh, the only timeline we have to work on is that moratorium, which, as I understand, expires in mid-October. If we, if we need to go longer to make everything real tight, we can do that. It's all up to you all. It's, it's your, your process from here forward. We will go over a very, very brief presentation. I think it's seven slides, just with some additional data that you all had requested to provide some additional context for your conversation this evening. And then uh, whatever, wherever the group wants to go from there, we're, we're happy to do that, of course. So before I turn it over to Rob, are there any questions that I can answer for you? All right. Hello again. Thanks for being here. Um, you guys should have all gotten a packet. So the first thing is the PowerPoint presentation. It's pretty short. So one slide per page, plenty of room to write notes and you can read it all. Um, after that is the ordinance uh, drafted by Nina. And then following that is a, a draft of what the application would look like. So part of that is just, hey, these are the questions we would ask. And then uh, Another of it is kind of like part of what the inspection it would look like. Um, and then following that is the usage table from the code that Councilmember Nakai asked to be shared so you guys can see what it currently looks like. And then uh, after that is a draft of the good neighbor policy. And I did go back and make some edits to that since it was emailed out to you guys. So there's a few changes, just uh, grammatical stuff mostly. All right. So, um, this is a pretty short presentation. I'm going to go through it as fast as I can so we have more time to talk and you guys can talk amongst each other. So last meeting, you guys asked to answer a couple of questions. So first thing was percentage caps versus density caps. Like, so what I learned about that is um, density caps are kind of the way that things used to be. And then more and more municipalities have started using percentage caps. A lot of them have both. And some of that is just because they never got the old one off the books. And then... Uh, but it does, it's, if your percentage caps keep help control your overall number, the density caps, what I mean by density caps are like that 500 foot separation or one per block face or one per block or so many per neighborhood, whatever. Um, but a lot of times they get used in conjunction with each other. So, you know, you could have your percentage cap that keeps your overall numbers down, but then they could all be in the same neighborhood without that density cap. So that seems to be the most common practice is both at the same time. Um, and then what is the percentage cap based on? So that's still really unclear, but what I found out, it's like, so that controls a lot of your fees. Like, you know, it's the, and how much can your staff handle? Like currently, you know, could we handle managing 500 short-term rentals, depending on what the management looks like. But so you would use that, uh, that maybe based on that, like what you can <clears throat> handle, what you could afford, um, that also goes into play when it talks about fees and things like that. More short-term rentals, they can spread those fees out. Maybe it costs less and things like that. But I haven't found a really definite reason that said, hey, our city decided to go with a 3% and this is why. Oh, Rob, can I just jump in? Absolutely. Most of my communities who have um, put a cap in, it's directly related to them wanting to make sure that um, housing becomes, a, um, it stays available to the workforce. So um, I know many of the uh, counties and cities and towns that have put like a 6% in the past like two years, it was mostly because of that affordability and availability issue. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and then you guys asked how many STRs are licensed in each zone. So with that, I went through, uh, we had about 180 STRs, um, went through those and mm -hmm. looked up which zone they were in and it's all listed in this chart. So you have each zone broken down um, and then the current STR licenses in each zone and then the poten potential build out of each zone and then the percent of total build out that are STRs and then where we're currently at our current build out and then the percentage of that current build out. So looking at the commercial, so this is really weird. So if you look down, um, basically, so if you look at our current build out for central business district, community commercial and neighborhood commercial, so they're 56, 67 and 38. We have more buildings than that in those zones. Those buildings have been permitted as residential use. So that's not to say we only have 56 buildings in our central business district, but we have 56 buildings that have been permitted to be used as, as, for residential use. Um, so, and then the anomalies. So there are 18 that I just can't find. So, yes. So really those numbers on the, on the current build out percentage or whatever, they're irrelevant because there's only so many residential getting percentages isn't relevant in those three in those three why? in the business districts and Correct. yes yeah or the commercial districts so the anomalies there were 18 licenses that i just can't find and that could be a numerous reasons um they might have put the wrong address in in the application um there could have been uh, some people using the teller county's website I guess some people's are hidden for security reasons, so it may have disappeared for that. Um, and then there's, uh, um, I mean, since the moratorium passed, like people came in to get licenses for for vacant lots, so they may not have had an address, so they just put their their current address down there. But so there there are 18 licenses out there that I just can't pin down right now. So that's the 18 anomalies. But other than that, you can see across the board where we're at. Um, total of our current build out right now, we're at 5.97%, basically for 5.97% of our total build out is being used as short term rentals. Can I, were you ever, were you able to develop any information on owner occupied versus non owner occupied? No. So I can't see that, um, currently the way that we do licensing. So these, you guys saw at the last meeting, these are just the things that uh, they're the same recommendations. That's what you had asked us to build or asked Nina to build the um, coordinates off of. And then, so these are just some other things to consider. Um, I, so on your ordinance in that first 522020, like it just kind of talks about the way um, licenses become available and I just kind of feel like that means like anytime a license becomes available because of a cap or whatever um, we go out and say hey there's a license available everybody apply for it and first one in gets it rather than do that I think it would be better to be we, we already have a list of people right now people can apply for a license they're just not getting approved so that list is stacking up and we know who was first so just continuing that list I think would be a, a, a good practice. Um, rather than every time a new one comes up, it's a lot of work for them. It's a lot of work for us. Just one running list. Um, and then some items not currently addressed. So um, the percentage cap versus the density cap, both are neither. Like, so that's just last time we talked, like you guys wanted to know, hey, why do some people use density caps? Why do some people use percentage caps? So just giving us guidance on, hey, which way do we want to go? Um, Citywide caps versus zoning caps. Like Nina brought up a good comment that, you know, regulating each zone differently is a little bit more work. Whereas like just doing, hey, across the board city, we want a cap of whatever percent or whatever, a lot easier to work with. Um, Non-owner occupied in residential zones. So in the last, we talked about potentially, um, sorry, prohibiting non-owner occupied STRs and single family residents. Um, having a certificate of occupancy requirement. So like I said, like right now we're giving people licenses or before the moratorium um, on vacant lots. So requiring them to actually have a place to, to run their business before they get a license, especially if there's only so many licenses. Um, 
limit to the number of licenses that a single person can have. Uh, some cities do that per zone. Like a single person can have more licenses in one zone than the other. Um, just other options. Liability insurance requirements. Any companies using like most of your major things like VRBO and Airbnb, like that kind of comes as a package, but people doing it on their own don't necessarily have insurance to cover. So existing licenses that are inconsistent with the new ordinance. So if you look in this ordinance at the, uh, the use table um, and they're not permitted in MFS and MSU. However, we have 11 STRs currently in MFSs and MSUs. What are we gonna do with those? Um, and then if, the, if you guys come up with a, um, a capacity limit that's less than what we have now, are we gonna grandfather them in or Sorry, no, you can. I just I want to clarify something. Um, there is no, not going to be an exemption. It's going to be if you see your one of your second to last section in your ordinance that anyone who has a current um, short uh, business license, they will still need to go in to have a short term rental license, totally separate. They 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 need to be up on that and, and do that once your moratorium ends. If you guys have a cap, then um, it addresses that we will cons that you'll consider those people first. So there's no exemptions. A person needs to proactively come into the city and apply for the new license because otherwise these regulations and their agreement to the license terms wouldn't apply. Does that make sense? No, and no grandfather. It's a business license use, not a zoning use. <laughs> okay, another thing is single family attached units. So right now we have single family attached units in, uh, in suburban residential or urban residential, they're they're not really multifamily zones, but they're like they're condos, they're things like that. Um, so it's just something else to look at, and make sure you get what you want out of it. Um, self self attestation versus in, of inspections versus the city inspections. So this goes into we've had some questions on hey, what is this going to cost to enforce? So that depends on what you want to do. So like looking at us at, at inspecting every one of these you're looking at the code enforcement officer working about about two hours per short-term rental to, to conduct an inspection um, another solution is hey you know we have a self-attestation of an inspection they say hey we've done all this it's all here and we say okay and then the code enforcement officer instead of maybe they still do 100%, but they spread it throughout the year. They don't just go out in January and inspect 180 properties. Um, or they say, hey, I'm just gonna pull 50% of these or 75%, 10%, whatever. So they just spot check rather than, than doing all of them. So that's just how to control those costs of enforcement. Um, but that's the difference. And then um, city enforcement cost recovery model that's just something that we should look at like hey how much is this going to cost and again that's really going to depend on what what comes out of all this what does the ordinance look like and what's required so putting a dollar amount on that right now is is impossible um the dda overlay district so karen might want to talk a little bit more about this but um you know we're talking about the um, dda property here it works. Okay. I've kind of like talked about a crazy, I, what, what, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> the DDA problem. <laughs> the, the, just busted. Just busted. The what Woodland Park want? overlay, the DDA. The crazy idea I had? Yeah. Okay. Um, that I can help with. Um, I had a crazy idea related to uh, the DDA at Woodland Park um, overlay zone district. Um, the, the Woodland Park Overlay Zone District is actually located within the Central Business District. So that's our downtown, the heart of our community. And, um, you know, some of you all may be aware that uh, we've had developers looking at wanting to do ground floor residential in that zone district, but our zoning currently has a standard in place that says residential in that zone district should be like second and third story. And you want to preserve that ground floor for commercial retail kind of uses. So the crazy idea was how can we incentivize um, uh, uh, upper floor residential uses. So you have, you know, live workspace, you know, people in a vibrant downtown, and then potentially pull STRs out of the residential zone district. And that was to um, basically exclude from the caps, um, or basically make, uh, you know, no limit that if every single residential unit in that Woodland Park overlay zone that is on an upper floor could get an STR license. So that was that was the crazy idea. So it can 
<clears throat> um, to um, in some ways potentially make it more desirable to put residential on upper floors instead of on the ground floor. Because uh, ground floor, um, when you think about a retail patron, uh, they're not likely to want to go upstairs to a business, um, especially if it's like a, a commercial shop kind of kind of situation. Um, a lot of times, especially in our, our little tight downtown, um, you know, that type of use is, is primarily on that that lower level, the ground floor. Um, but you can see, you know, residential uses on the upper floors. So how can we maximize our ground floor commercial retail space? and still um, make it desirable to have a residence, you know, in that area without, you know, taking away ground floor land area for residential use. So, if that made a little more sense. Okay. A lot of downtown areas have that overlay where they do that exactly that. So the, the last thing on here, or yeah, the last thing on here is non-performance. So that is like, you know, if you're only going to give out so many of these licenses, then you like people that just have a license for the sake of having a license are wasting the license. The city's not getting revenue from it. It's not bringing in visitors. Um, so some sort of requirement that, hey, if you have a license and you don't use it like 20 days out of the year or whatever you want to set it at, then you lose it the next year. So it's just like, you know, um, these things, they're a benefit to the city. They bring people here. They um, bring customers to our stores. So for someone to have the license and not be using it, it's kind of just wasting it. So by saying, hey, you, you have to be um, active or else you lose your license the next year, I think is a, is a good solution to prevent that. That's it for the slideshow. So the rest of the time is yours to ask us questions or talk amongst yourselves. Who would yeah. like to go first? I saw Carol's hand, but no, go ahead, Carol. I, I, I was just going to ask that Nina go over the ordinance, or are we just going to talk about the points brought out in Rob's slide presentation? Yes, you are. Just to work tell session. us how she came up with it. Right. So I don't, just one question before we go there, if I could. I, I'd just like to know, so that we're all on the same page, what a non-owner occupied and and well hold on let me look at the words owner occupied what is a non-owner occupied what's an owner occupied so what the way me we define that as an owner occupied is if an owner lives in the home for 185 days out of the year or more okay. um so and then that's gone by their voter registration their driver's license whatever but that's their that's their residence um for at least 185 days out so of the year. So it's our primary residence. I, yeah, I would, I, would, we would, I would like to define it, it same idea, but just primary residence. Cause like uh, Rob said that to follow the, um, and we have strict language that we could use, like you said, voter registration, tax returns, sure. or vehicle registration. So something that came to mind just to, for consideration before we move forward is maybe a delineation between residents and non-residents versus owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. So that's just another consideration I think that we could consider. Thank you. No, I think it's a, it's a great point because I've been reading a, a bunch of other municipalities' ideas mm -hmm. um, and they definitely differentiate um, a resident occupied versus a non-resident. And it kind of goes a little bit to Robert, what you're concerned when you and I spoke about how you can have the big corporations coming in. Those would be non-resident. Um, but they don't have to owned. be occupied. See, Correct. occupied That's is a, is a word that can owned. be troublesome for me because, because there's residents of Woodland Park that don't live in this property that they own. But yet they're here. They're present. They can right. respond to inquiries. They they manage the property and are are here physically. Whereas um, a non-resident that may be in Philadelphia that has something here, they may have a management company, but most of them aren't open in the evening. It just is that whole uh, accountability piece to me. We're in violent agreement. 
So either I said something mm -hmm. no, wrong I, or you misunderstood something. No, no, I agree violent with you. Agreement. I think we're on, on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but we, it, but we, I was talking to Robert. Robert had brought up a valid point that I just want to throw out on the table about corporations. And we put that in the in. ordinance, that concern. It's on. <laughs> it's in 522-020-B. Licenses may only be issued to owners of properties who are a natural person, a trust, or an entity registered with the Colorado Secretary of State. Well, the entity that I kind of yeah, I wondered about issue. that, an entity uh, registered with the Colorado Secretary of State, anybody can do that, and they're not a person. Yeah. So that and, that, and they don't necessarily that, live in Colorado. And they don't even necessarily live in Colorado, but well, they, they fulfill the state. Right. It depends on like, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, if you want them to live in the state, then we can say the person who's behind that LLC, or, or you could just say LLCs, LLPs. Um, it, you, go, you guys could flush it out, and we'll talk. You know, we'll amend it appropriately. But that's that. That's to address the concern that you ha had. Just that's where it would be. Um, if you want it further restricted, we can do that too. Yeah, but I think where I was going with that is we certainly don't want hedge funds coming in and buying a property and investing in it and having outsiders in that regard. But I have the other side of the coin, and Lee kind of uh, touched on it, and that is. Um, owner occupied versus non owner occupied, you know, the very first tenant is a man's home is this castle. So I want to be very careful that we are not somebody who has a spare bedroom, which Airbnb started with who had a spare bedroom and said, Hey, you know, I want to supplement because I'm getting older, lost my job, whatever else. Um, I want to make sure that we're not regulating that like we're regulating the rest. I'd like to make sure that we're very clear to separate out people who live in their home and are renting out a room on a short-term basis versus people who are making it a business to rent out their entire home and uh, or multiple homes or whatever. So uh, I didn't see anything in that in the ordinance. And I wonder how other people feel about the fact of protecting the privacy of a person's castle. I, I, we discussed that, I believe, in the last work session we have. And I thought there was some general nodding of heads with, this, with that the thought is that... Uh, someone in their, their own or their principal residence that house is that house is being used appropriately whether he has a border in the back or not a border in the back and uh, and or just the principal talking man told him his castle or some some other combination of things those should not be limited um, if if the ordinance is to go ahead in the sort of structure it has here it, it should be it should be made clear that the cap does not apply to owner occupied uh, and right. I didn't see right. that. So that's just structurally, if we keep if we keep it this way, um, right? And, For owner occupied, maybe maybe we might even want to consider uh, a minimum number of stays before you have to even consider getting a short term rental license. That if you only have your rooms rented out less than thirty days a year, or something like that, because there are senior citizens who want to supplement their income, and it's very easy to have somebody stay for a week and make some money to pay the bills and stuff. But I know my mother in law did that, but. That uh, long-term rental that doesn't work for them, and they don't want to rent it out unless they have to. And now they got to go through this whole license thing and all this to do that in their own home. It's it's very onerous for a senior. So it's there may be some exclusions here that take fair care of owner occupied and uh, people who don't do this that take up a whole license for two weeks a year. Carol, um, I, I appreciate all of the comments that have been made thus far, but I, I know we did not want to go down any rabbit holes tonight. We've only had a day and a half to look at this draft ordinance. I only asked that Nina explain how she came up with the structure of this, not the details. If we could have her do that, please. Yeah, Mayor Lake, please do. So we, like Rob said, we took um, the guidance for the most part of, of what everyone uh, consensus maybe you know was brought up at the last meeting this is obviously a conversation starter like i've told some of you uh this is a work session for you all um so the the structure is is based on recommendations for just generally if you're going to have these regulations um i've drafted many of these throughout the state and then the policy parts that are in here are what you directed at the work session so um versus definitions, and those are written in a very specific way for a very articulate purpose, which is local contact person. We were told that's important. You wanna make sure it's very um, specifically um, defined. Um, sh Short-term rental unit, we were told that you didn't want them in apartment buildings, um, and then to separate them from bread and breakfast establishments, because that'll be something else in the use code, campgrounds, and then 
are these tents temporary structures that would not be safe that wouldn't be a residential unit uh, we want to make sure lodging tax goes back to make sure that they're paying a lodging tax um, the licensing limitations are um, things that were brought up um, like I brought up this national person etc um, I did believe that you said you if it was a person with an LLC in Colorado you'd still want them to have it so we could flush this out but it's kind of this is a prompt discussion and see what everyone's thinking um, so whether if you want the entity to be registered with the Colorado State with the main person who lives in Colorado or do you only want it to be a uh, an LLC or an LLP, which are smaller than these larger corporations, that's fine. But um, and then we also have proof of ownership, which also eliminates some of the corporate owners. Um, and these are just enforcing things like make sure you have your business license and title. Um, the applications are important because that's the really the way you're going to enforce short term rentals and you do it any in any other location is not by giving them a ticket for hundred dollars. It's by um, having the a, a, a uh, the threat of a hearing just either suspend the license or revoke the license that's what we do in liquor that's you know that's the value of of it and in all my municipalities even just the, a letter that, that this is coming up um people comply right away much more than a ticket so um i i was later on i was very specific in that language um can, can i interrupt just one second yeah. before we get too far along when you mentioned about the um uh, uh owner occupied uh in town how many ordinances that are you familiar with that you've actually done uh, like Chafee County that requires you live in Chafee County to own a short-term rental, whether you live in that short-term rental or not? A lot of the ones that are primary residents, it's of the unit being rented, but in the past like year or so, they're expanding to primary residents of either the city or the county. But you only can live in Chafee County to own a short-term Anything rental, future, yeah. Right, okay. Denver, so, Idaho Springs, I mean, city of Denver, you have to only, you only could rent your primary residence itself, not even if another one in right. Denver, so. So yeah, those are common. Um, and that also deals with the corporations coming over to, uh, taking over as well. And then uh, um, now I'm on, I don't know, page three of the ordinance. The name of the license applicant must must match the name of the owner and the deed that goes to again to the uh, corporate ownership because the applicant must possess at least 50 in percent interest. Um, and that's the data that's in Teller County County and Recorder. Um, we put in a cap because that we just to again start the discussion, six percent. I think we pick six percent because you're almost at six percent. But this, again, this all of this is to get policy direction for you. Um, or to, did we take it in at this moment yet so soon, uh, you know, so far. Um, but the way it's written is purposeful. Like, that's why you have me, but you give policy direction. Um, you want to, I think it was important for you to have a local contact person who's responding right away within an hour. Um, then we go to application issues and renew renewals. You might think there's a little repetition, but it's purposeful to kind of point to other sections. Um, again, if, if this passes, anyone with a business license that has operated short-term rental, they'll need to come in to the city and get this special license so that they follow these regulations. And then they need to continue to um, follow your regulations every single year, every, you know, upon renewal. Otherwise, you, they won't be renewed or they could, it could be revoked. Again, this is how you enforce what's important um, for you as a community. And the revocation and suspension language, it's it's been written very particular because for due process um, points, you want to make sure you give someone written notice, you want to make sure there's listed reasons that these are the only reasons that you can suspend or revoke a license. Um, again, just from my experience and there's penalties and then short and then so the first is your first year is your title five, which is business licensing. Then we are re, then we go into 18, which is uh, land use your land use code. So there the table of uses. Um, we got the direction that multifamily should not uh, permit and then PC means permitted use, uh, permitted conditionally. That alerts the reader that it's not just permitted outright. And then we're, what, we're gonna look in the code and it's gonna, we're gonna get the business license. We gotta get, you know, we gotta follow the rules. Um, and then there's just further uh, specifications that are a little more proper to make sure that it's in the land use code versus the business licensing section. So that's why I separated it out. But again, um, oh, and then I put events, events such as concerts, parties, and weddings are prohibited because I felt that was part of goes to the community character. Um, can, can I ask, an, uh, I'm sorry, I just, all the way at the front, section three, um, we now have two definitions for short-term rentals. 
I mean, one one enough, we couldn't figure that one out. So now so we So the reason two. is because uh, it's, it's very purposeful because you want to make sure that definition is for sure defined in your land use code because that goes, Frank, to what you've been talking about for months. I know, I'm just So it, ne it, 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 needs, it needs to be there, right? Because it's going to be in the use table. And then it's mostly a business licensing issue, and that's why it's defined twice. So I, it, are these two different licenses? If you own more than one short-term rental unit, you have to have a different correct. business license? Correct, because the applicant has to be the owner showed by the deed of that property. Okay, thank you, Nina. So yeah, if there's any other questions for any of us, and then direction like that, you know, do 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 you guys some feel that certain sections should be tweaked, added, separated? That's what we're here for, just to start a conversation. So so back to the the uh, person who is renting out a room, uh, supplementing their income or whatever. Two areas that kind of bothered me in this was um, 5.22a, 5.22 whatever it is, 5. 22.0.2, it says, it shall be unlawful for any person or entity to engage in a short-term rental business without first applying for the license. So I personally like to see a, a distinction between somebody who is living in their home, renting out a room versus somebody who's renting your entire place. Second to that is- I wrote down that note. Sorry? I wrote down that note already. When okay. Under B3, it says an entity registered with the state of uh, Colorado Secretary of State. And I made a note in here, except hedge funds and their affiliates. I don't know if you can do that. I don't know how you say that in the law, but um, that's the point of keeping it local. Right. Um, I might, I understand the point. So we might just look into is that. Um, an entity registered with the Colorado Department of State where the majority of owner lives in Colorado or something or LLC or LP that achieves the, achieves that objective that you're talking about. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah, Robert, I would say- um, I'd say lives in Teller County and then you don't have, you have no issue. I mean, you could still have a hedge fund, but the odds are pretty slim that we have them in Teller County. Well, I have a couple of things here. So um, it's not just hedge funds. One of the residents brought up that the Marriott was getting into this business. Yeah. And I looked into it and they are. Um, so it would have to cover that kind of thing as well. And, um, you know, as far as, uh, uh so that they thing? can't advertise because they're probably doing something like I have a short-term rental and they're making it exposing just like Airbnb has it on their website. They're trying to do it on Marriott. Right. Website. But you could look it on a, on a Marriott website instead of through like Airbnb or through a private individual that owns, um, and they have probably a lot more capital to buy. So. Um, and the other thing is uh, limiting to uh, residents that live here only. There should probably be a simulation in there if you want that. That there, maybe there's someone that because uh, I see I think half of this town's Texas during the summer, um, but you know there might be folks that live in that residence seasonally, and own it and they live out of state. They have an out of state residence. So I'd like to consider that as well, um, as a rule, that uh, if they do live on the property you know, for a certain amount of time, you know, something to at least discuss that they could uh, rent that out um, in the summer while they're down in Texas during the winter, I, you know, something to that effect. There's three properties on South Street that are owned by three families. Each family, the cabins, they were built in the 1930s. Each family has owned each of those three cabins for 90 years. None of them are suitable for residential. They're all short-term rentals. They have been short-term stay places for the families for 90 years. And I don't think we should penalize them that they can no longer short-term rental those properties or devalue those properties with our ordinance. They don't live in Colorado. What do you suggest for those folks then? Well, some provision for grandfathering properties that are so, pretty much only suitable for short-term rental. Can I just clarify so we get direction? Because if there's no cap, it depends on if you guys do a cap. If there's no cap, your two situations are, are irrelevant. Those two those two situations should definitely still get a short-term rental license. So is that your issue? Like if you if your guys are going to do a cap, you want to discuss that particular situation? I mean, I, I assume we're going to do a cap. I wasn't here. I was on vacation last uh, council meeting. Well, let me, so. let me also that, clarify that, uh, let me clarify something real quick too. We already have 185 days per year is owner occupied. 
So if you want to, well, just, just or primary resident. So they need to have ta tax refunds, voter registration, right? All that, yeah. So if it's not a primary residence, then we need an exception. And you need to think of what kind of language or in what type of exception you want to make. I would agree to have an exception for people in our community like that. I don't, I don't know how to word it or what, I don't know if you want to say like 60 day. What, what it, uh, exception, because we, we I agree right. in the ordinance that if they have a license now that they can still go and get one if you guys have a cap. Or well, cause you're asking that they not have to get a license. Well, there's I just a, argue, there's an issue that they have a license. It's a short-term rental. It's not suitable for long-term stay. It doesn't have the kind of features a house would have. It's a yeah. little cabin. It's been this way for 90 years. Right. And the families still own them, but none of the families live in Colorado. Right. They come out here two weeks a year, maybe. And we've got to know them and, and meet them and help them out with some stuff from time to time. Anyway, it's an interesting story. But, but nothing in your ordinance so far, just so you guys don't, says the, anything about the residency. cap affects the property value of those short term rentals. If they transition those to another owner, the cap is on the short term rental license. It doesn't apply to the next owner. So they can't get a license for that to be a short term rental. The property becomes a lot less valuable because it's not useful for much else. Well, so I would suggest that if they're using that becomes a problem for the property owner if they decide to let it go and have somebody else buy it. I mean, because I now it's, I would say that if that's the case, if it's just as strictly a business interest only mm -hmm. and they want to sell, it's not my responsibility um, in this case for them to run their business to make sure that their business is yeah. worth that much money in the property value. Uh, and yeah. You could do a 50 year historical <laughs> exemption for buildings. That's that's all I'm thinking. But yeah, so here, these are here, these are not apartments. Those are not homes. Said that. That's already not, said that. Yeah, Here, here's where we are now. Somebody. We've been given a draft ordinance that uh, Nina has put mile markers in for us to discuss, and it's going to go to the Planning Commission first. And certainly these are issues that we should consider in the Planning Commission before we recommend it back to the City Council. But uh, going down this rabbit hole is exactly what Frank said. Let's not do denial. Let's pull this That's back fine. in. We'll walk it right in there, too. Yeah, we, we've got a... <laughs> We've got an ordinance to review. The city, or the planning commission will review it first, and then we'll uh, make a recommendation to the city council. So, Nina, um, 18.06.481, short-term rental unit, page, I think it's page three or something. It says short-term rental unit means privately owned residential dwelling unit or portion thereof. Uh, what are you intending to say there by a portion thereof? So that would be if we were, I would like to know if we have, um, or if in, uh, there's not a huge disagreement with, you know, what you brought up with the per person renting their room, that, that's some of that, that might be hard to enforce. But if, if you're, if they are, you are going that way, then you would take away the portion thereof. Mm -hmm. Cause that's for the situation where, like you said, Airbnb was originally for, is that if they, uh, if someone rents, um, like maybe the top floor of their house, um, and you kind of share, like, sh like Bear Airbnb has allows you to share um, space with people. So that depends on if you, if everyone agrees that it's something separate. If you're just renting a room in your house versus the whole house, then that would be take, uh, taken away. I don't think you have to make that distinction here. I think the owner occupancy would apply whether the owner is there or not there. You don't have to. You, you, you do but want, Robert you, was saying they shouldn't get the license at all. You, you Oh, okay. Well, if you just say not licensed at all, at all I, I think I'm making a distinction, and I don't know how you, the rest of you, feel about it. But I'm making a distinction. My home is my castle, and if I want to supplement a room in it for um, for my income, to have the city come in, inspect it, regulate it, and everything else becomes very invasive to to my privacy, and that's different than somebody who's making a business of their entire home. And I think we should make that allocation or make that allowance for them to protect their privacy, protect their freedom of their of what happens in their own home, as opposed to somebody who's using their home intentionally as a business venture. And then and then it further distinguishes what you're saying from someone who it is their primary residence, but when they go on vacation, they rent the whole house out. That's that's definitely should be within the regulations versus what you're saying. Correct. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I just want to make sure I got that clear because that's like a third definition kind of like we have yeah. 185 days um, 
that they live in the home. And so I would like us to take away the 185 days because yeah, that doesn't show just to make anything. it their primary residence. primary residence is voter registration, um, okay. voter vehicle registration. I have I have good language for that. It, yeah, it, it's very hard to count days. It's very hard to enforce. It's, they could be on an RV trip for a year. And but then there's another <laughs> that's category residence. that's people that live in their home maybe 365 days out of the year. They just rent out a room whenever oh, they sure. want. Okay, that's what yeah, Councilor Zulaga brought up. So yeah, you're right. It would be a separate if if um way to address it we would have to put in the code that it doesn't apply but um I, I would also want to make it very clear that if they do leave for a week and rent the whole place out then it's definitely back to these regulations because that could be very easily um just, but then how do you enforce clear, that yeah we should be very clear this is this is important it, it affects a lot of things too but among the other things is whatever cap we've got we just gained a whole bunch more room in the cap because some some share of these will no longer be counted apparently so we want to, we're looking for a definite, is that right. right? We're looking for a definition that says if somebody is in their principal, their primary residence, if they rent out only a portion of it while they're occupying it, that's not covered by this ordinance. It's not, and it doesn't affect any cap or anything else. Correct. And it also doesn't, they're not subject to, because they don't have to get a license, they don't have to come in and report on the smoke detector or their property insurance or anything else. So that's correct. correct. And I all think right. that's but, a planning recommendation. Okay. But okay. if it's the if and if it's somebody's primary residence, but they're gone, if they're then short term then, kicks in. Then that does that does get short term. And does that does that then count as part of a cap if there is one? I believe it well, would. Well, they would re require a license and we recap you know, the number of licenses. Again, we might want to revisit the number of days well, per year that they're right. planning to. Do short term rentals so that we don't tie up a bunch of licenses. I, that would be very hard to enforce. Yeah. Yeah. That would be very, very hard to enforce. I would not Great recommend that. Great point. But yeah. yeah. I just like to touch there's a revenue on issue those there cabins too. again. <laughs> I'd like to finish my thought on that. So just because they have those cabins and had them for 90 years, when they want to sell them, I understand the property value thing, but they they have to renew those licenses every year. It's not a guarantee. I agree. So Understood. it's it's not something that I feel for. I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, I wanted to be able to keep that. But even for them, they won't get special privilege over somebody sitting in this audience that has bought a house that is, uh, you know, planning to use that as a short term rental. You know, unfortunately, they so, you know, that's just we have to keep that fair across the board. And I, I know that's that's tough. And I don't want to hear that. But that's how I feel about that. But no, if, they, if they renew the license on an annual basis and they keep their license active, then it doesn't seem like that that license goes back in the pool. They're just right? not transferable. That's correct. It's just only on but, property. But if they it, sell the property, we, we have then a, that's an issue the, with the property ownership changing hands. Correct. That the license couldn't be ex, uh, Can be transferred, transferred, transferred right. or it shouldn't be. No, uh, that's they that's like everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's if there's right. already a cap. They know they can't get it. Well, that's a buyer beware issue. I'm just thinking of the families who've been coming here for 20 years mm -hmm. vacationing in that cabin. Sure. Yeah. That's, 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 their, yeah. that's our so place to go. They're selling it, yeah. <laughs> but there's it's one that actually years. came on the market yesterday. Gonna it. oh, it's going to make a profit anyway. <laughs> that is, is the same deal. It's been it's been a VRBO, and I'm not sure why, but now it's being sold as a single family home. Right. Um, because for whatever reason, I, mean, I don't know if it's it because that. of this, yeah. but they're not going to rent it any longer and it's being sold for a family residence. Right, because they don't have a right to sell the business license. The right. city right. that owns the correct. Yep, that's, yeah, definitely. Okay, anyway. Like you said, we'll be doing this on the planning commission. So if, if I may ask a clarif clarification question, y'all, it sounds like y'all are, not wanting to have regulations on folks who have as the primary residence one of these homes and then is running out of room. Do you, are, do you still are you still okay issuing a license, just not having it count against the cap? No, no license. How will this be enforced? That was my like, question. How will today you to know how to? So. Who's doing what then? Yeah, that's that's the concern I have because then if I mean. If one of our efforts here is to provide more housing for long-term rental and affordable housing for workers and things like that, an owner-occupied residence, whether we regulate it or not, isn't going to produce any additional housing by what we put in this ordinance. But the other short-term rental stuff that we do do would affect that. When the rent so I don't see now. that there's any value other than potential revenue for the city. 
I mean, I agree. That, which again, is gonna be hard to regulate. It's gonna yeah. cost us more money. And I agree with council member Zulawaga's principle of it. I don't like any of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we should be able to do with our homes what we want to do and the government shouldn't be involved. Right. But but it is and this is where we're at. So but my concern is how on earth is the city going to enforce you know whether I'm at my house all the time and renting a room 3 days out of the week or you know 12 days or 6 days and I have like five bedrooms in my house, like how is that going to be regulated versus, you know, I'm not advertising on Airbnb and I'm doing it. I mean, that's going to happen anyways, but, but to put it in words, like I, I want to know how you put it in wording and how the city can enforce that. It may be that we can only regulate when an entire structure is yeah. rented Correct. that's exactly room. right yeah, yeah. Correct. because we don't Make apply for permission the... to go on vacation for three months and rent out our home right right, right. the entire right. structure but... i just go on vacation and rent out my home if i want to and but if you did it for less than 30 days if you well and, and that's, trade with that's people consistent in with this with the business <laughs> license and the lodging tax code as well mm -hmm. because if it's 30 days or greater there's no tax due it's it's not considered Mm -mm. It's that, yeah, so it's, it's consistent with this so that makes sense yeah. to me yeah. I, I think it, it it goes back to the only thing i think that was ever broken is that we didn't have a definition mm -hmm. a definition within our code we had bits and pieces which made us look like we were violating our own code we are the most important thing for us to do the most important thing for us to do is to make it as simple as possible for the average property owner right. Right. i agree and if it's, you know, if it gets too onerous to try to say, well, we're going to regulate whether or not you rent your bathroom out on a <laughs> right. daily basis. And maybe our definition, and, and tonight is not the night to decide, but maybe the definition is simply for short term rental of an entire structure. Maybe, I don't, but this is not the place nor the time. Well, I think we do want direction for everyone. That would really help. Um, and also the second thing is um, 522.20D says that short-term rental licenses shall include their business license number on the title. So if there isn't a business license number, then you would look into that. So that might be a way to deal with um, general compliance and also the, the situation that um, Robert's bringing up because if they start to run, rent out their whole house, you, you see that they don't have a license number and then you look into it. Plus there's um, uni revs and that kind of thing that of course. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's doable on the websites. I don't know if they allow it's, for it's, it's required that kind of many jurisdictions. Yeah, I, yes, so this is, is the yes. license number. So it would be on the DRBOA. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in the title. Perfect. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I took this from other. The the ordinance says it has to be in the title. I don't think it needs to be in the title, but it needs to be in the list. That's where you get most uh, the best enforcement because you quickly, the clerks quickly look and they say they really appreciate that, but that's up to you guys. But it's, uh, if it's in the title. That, that would create a little bit of a like problem that. for us if we have owner occupied don't have a license and non-owner occupied or full buildings do have a license. Your enforcement goes out the window again because you'll have a No, it doesn't. Because if they're renting just a room, you look, you click on the link and you see that they're only renting the room. If they're renting the whole house. Sure, but yeah. you have to go on down. You can't just look at the title. I would put in the title. That's why I would. Oh, but if they don't have the can, number, then they you won't have the number. You still don't know if it's okay yeah, or not because you have to look on down, see what they're renting. But it provides something. So Right, right. I think our challenge is right now is trying to balance the, the administration and the enforcement to keep it as simple as possible. Yes. Yeah. And then you know, we can actually make it work <laughs> without getting into the what if and then yes. this would happen. And we can get into a whole exception of things. So I, I just, we're trying to really work hard to keep it simple. Larry, I would agree with you, and and I would just say that we may we may put these regulations in place, and and we'll it's a starting point, right? It's it's a place to start, and I like your idea of keeping it simple, um, and but our our attorney also has advised us that we it's easier to become less restrictive if we make changes because they this can be changed as we learn, we can put something in place and we can implement it and we're going to learn from it and we're going to refine it and hone it in to where it works as we move through time just like anything and and we can refine it 
it's harder to become more restrictive as we refine than it is to become less restrictive as we re refine. Mm -hmm. So just a thought there, because it's a starting place, probably won't be perfect, probably never will be perfect, but I think that it's a, it's a place to start so that we can get people off this hold that we're on. Um, with with some, I mean, we're talk, talking about good things and and to refine some things already, but keep in mind that it's not cast in stone for the rest of our world, and that we can revisit it as we learn from it. This is yeah, this is very simple because yes, what you guys wanted. This is only four pages of if you actually look at the regulations, but I think um, someone else's point. It's good to get policy direction. I think you know if we're going to nitpick words, like explain like why the, that word was in it, but it's more like kind of like how I report up like the larger like what policy, policy issues do you see? And I know some of you, you all. I, I mean, Michael could interrupt me, but I, that would help me. Is is um, you know. I don't want to debate like why a certain word it was purposeful, but it's more the general concept. Like, is there anything here that's missing or anything here generally that you don't like or so we could get direction? Well, I saw something in there about, to your point, Larry, about a self, uh, self-regulation versus inspection. And I think on a simplicity standpoint, I would much prefer self-regulation. And then if there's a violation or it becomes to the notice that, you know, that they're bothering the neighbors, whatever else, and they find that the self-regulation uh, hasn't been effective, then it would be like uh, withdrawal of the permit or whatever would be of the license. So uh, less cost to the city, absolutely, and less kind of onerous in your face. I think let them self-regulate. If they screw up, then that's where you come down. Yes, that's why I say the inspection worksheet, but we could put self-inspection or call it whatever the staff called it. Yeah, what did you call it? So it was a worksheet that was attached to the license. Right. So that's what this refers to, but I could make the words more clear. It, but that serves as an affidavit. So um, an applicant signs that they obligated they themselves to, to um, adhere to the That's true affidavit. as well. Um, that if this is in the application materials, it doesn't need to be in the code itself. So that's up to you all. Because I, I, we still could revoke the license for not following the terms of the license. Could you, yeah, that's could you correlate for that's me simple. the a supplemental material by the license standards and review criteria, the good neighbor document and such? Yeah. Yeah. Rob did that, so I'll, let, I'll pass it over to him. Okay, the reason I say because those aren't connected to the statute. Yes, the statute are. refers to the fact there is a good neighbor policy. It refers to anything right. relating regarding the application. So if they if they violate any terms of their license or their application, they can be brought back okay. in front of you. Right, but since since the specifics of the license application aren't set forth in the ordinance. Does that mean it's our city manager or his designee from time to time will just put in what those conditions are? Every year the person there? signs on to it. So if they still want to yeah. come, if no, they still want to be. No, I'm not, I'm not being clear there. Question is, what is the sheet that they're signing on to? It's not connected to the ordinance. It doesn't, it's it's the good neighbor guidelines that um, are in the packet and they're gonna they change okay, from year to year. The ordinance just says it doesn't connect up to them. It does is connect this, up. Like is, there, is the intent that the as schedules to the ordinance there will be the application criteria, good neighbor they, guidance? They don't or? need to be because the, the code refers to this and this changes every year. Every time someone they have to sign it every year. If somebody has an, a license, in order to get a license, they need to sign this. We cannot change it uh, mid-year, but we can change it year to year. And I can bring, you could bring them in front of the city council for a public hearing that would not violate due process, that if they violated this, they can have their license revoked. So- Okay, so you're saying, so the, you know, the ordinance doesn't need to say that, that the good neighbor, the good neighbor guidelines shall be as the city may establish from time to, you know, year to year or something it's because it, i say um violation of the chapter any terms pertaining to license including the requirements and good neighbor guidelines listed on the short-term rental licenses i guess all right I'm sorry. well and then they attest to the license yeah yeah but and I'm, that's but I'm saying they the, agree to but, everything but the license there's nothing stated in the ordinance which says what are those pieces that are in the license the, the city staff could give one one day and another one the other day just because mm -hmm. it's not it's not cross referenced. It is cross referenced. I made sure of it because it says any terms that pertain to license, including the requirements and good neighbor guidelines listed on their license. So they are accepting the license. Okay. So it's uh, okay. I'm sorry. Whoever lists it on their license decides. Apparently, they get the license every year. So if they have an issue with it, they cannot do business with the city. 
right? Because I was told by all of you that you didn't want to make it complicated, so we wanted to have it separate. Um, at, this is I. This is definitely if we revoke yeah. someone's license because they didn't follow the good neighbor guidelines, we're definitely covered because the person has accepted the license every year. They they get those that application. Um, and as and as staff works through it, you can modify these things to keep up with the times. It does with the business with the license applications just like we do with business license applications without having to go through the public hearing process and the ordinance process and updating the code the code refers to this and and staff with best practices will amend these things from time to time right. to keep them current and function well so it makes sense and that's how i know that's how the business license ordinance worked although I see a difference between this and the business license ordinance is that this is more of a regulatory, it has consequences, we can revoke a license, whereas the business license has no teeth like that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a vehicle with which to collect and properly re, re collect sales and sales taxes and use taxes for the city. It, it registers businesses so that we can then be sure that they're all on the same page. So that's what I see as a difference here with this license is that it does have consequences and it can be revoked. Yeah, there's two different separate. I'm even reading yeah. another section. There have been no violations of the requirements and good neighbor guidelines listed on the short term rental license and application materials. So the person's definitely put on notice about those. Lee, Lee did you get all your thoughts out? Because I kind of feel like you're trying to make a point. And did... All right. Well, I was just trying to Carol. So there's. She agreed that we, we can add a provision when we see this next time the reference. I, I actually, I mean, well, actually, I have a, just sort of a bunch of issues with this, but um, the, a lot of the things we're looking at are the standards that are set forth to go in the application. Should we be talking about each of those, the ones we like or don't like? Because mm -hmm. I mean, some of them are sort of not even normal life licensing. One I thought was interesting, no meal should be prepared for or served yeah. to the renter by the owner or the <laughs> owner's Well, that goes back to the right definition right. of a bed and breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Which, exactly. Which, no, it exact, Carol's exactly right. So it's, it's, it's actually, it may be important to put that in, which means it shouldn't just be hanging around here. Did you remember the application? It should be in the ordinance saying, no, don't serve food, because the way you figure out what a bed and breakfast is, it's a, it's a place, it's a short-term rental that if you look at the later on, the things they can do in that short rental, it says they shall serve breakfast. That's the only thing that creates it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you wish to tie up existing parts of the ordinance, we oddly enough, we need to figure out, do you serve, do you serve breakfast or don't you serve breakfast? Because serving breakfast is a traditional bed and breakfast, and they're authorized in commercial districts. And I think everybody probably think that's, thinks that's in the definition right. of short term rental unit. I say not to include bed and breakfast establishments. And, and we may need to make that more specific. Um, again, I don't want us to overthink this, but again, we've only had a day and a half to review it. Um, but there, again, there's, there's some aspects of this that we need to make sure we don't allow short-term rentals to turn into bed and breakfast. And if we need more specificity, I thought I'd never use that word um, in the ordinance and so be it. But um, I think it's also important for us to, to not change the goalposts for any of our applicants and say, oh, halfway through the year, we changed the good neighbor uh, guidelines and uh, change. I just confirmed that would never happen. It's a, in, on the application and year. on the license. So we would have to give a new license that the people would be on notice. You all said you didn't want the good neighbor guidelines in the ordinance. If we have a majority mm -hmm. of you saying that, otherwise we'll do it otherwise. But to change an ordinance that which requires two readings, planning commission approval, you we did we separate them because you all guided us that way. Mm -hmm. But if you oh no, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm just saying if we have an affidavit that gets signed with certain right. requirements, we shouldn't change it in the middle of the year. No, no, no. we never do that. We never could do that legally. They've still signed it when they got their license, so they and would, every year they, they wouldn't be able to sign it till the next. We could change it the next day, but they wouldn't be under it till they sign the, the next, next year. One, right, because every later. year they need to renew. And as prior to the renewal procedure period or whatever, the things need to be changed. You make those changes now, mm -hmm. whereas they renew, they yeah. agree to those no changes. I, I think we've all brought up some very good points, but we're at the um, diminishing returns point now, aren't we? <laughs> Well, well you're, you're, I'll go ahead. I have one um, pretty much, 
I've agreed with most of what everybody said tonight. The only thing that I have an issue with really, particularly if we go down the whole, my house is my castle. Um, the problem I have is the table now because you're now going to allow businesses to buy residential houses and use them as lodging. So if, if we're not going to regulate somebody's castle and they're renting a room, then do we really need to have short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods? Shouldn't they belong where the other lodging is, which is neighborhood commercial, community commercial, and, and blah, blah, blah. So that's my. The NAP bans short term rentals. Yeah, just well, not if, you look at, not if you look at the, uh, at the list. No, not if you look at the. No, it, well, maybe, okay, maybe. I haven't sold any residentials. In a commercial well, but we zone. have 77 current licensed residential homes that are zoned or that are that are STRs. Now we don't have we don't know how many of those are owner occupied or residential or whatever. So maybe they all are and we're fine, right? Maybe they're not. So I don't that's just my my two cents. We can take it or leave it. Catherine, uh, I, I think that the, the market is speaking that people want to come to Woodland Park and they want to live in a Woodland Park neighborhood and they want to enjoy that experience. Maybe, but the residents don't want them there. So you've got, so, you've well, got, you've some, you've got both sides. So I'm just playing I know. both, both sides, giving everybody. And that's why I'm thinking yeah. that that's exactly why we're, we're dealing with these regulations. And that's why these regulations are not going to be 100% correct the first time we go through it, but it's going to be an attempt to provide for this use is a commercial use in a residential neighborhood. And we just kind of safeguard that those neighborhoods. Nina, I have a question on the um, separation of the good neighbor. So if they violate the good neighbor policy, you can still revoke their license. Right? Correct. And then what because the they signed the license and they, it was in the application materials and I refer to it. We uh, to Lee's point, you refer to things in the ordinance all the time for like a fee schedule, this or that. Um, and I list um, that the I list that in two places where it says, um, let's see, good neighbor. Um, no, that answers my question. Yeah, I, you don't look it up. I just want to be clear because it's what I saw. And I, I it says, yeah, there have been no. So the city may renew a license have, if there's been no violations of the requirements and good neighbor gate guidelines listed on the short term rental license and application materials. And then in revocation suspension, it says violations of any provisions, yada, 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 including the requirements and good neighbor guidelines listed on the short term rental licenses. So it's something that they've accepted every year. Of course, we couldn't change it in the middle of the year and, and revoke that would that would violate due process and constitutional due process. I'm just we wondering how that. you enforce that if it's not in the ordinance. Because because we, we refer to it because it says um, that the license can be revoked for any of the following reasons. And one of them is any of the terms pertaining to their license, including the requirements and good neighbor gate guidelines listed on the short term rental licenses. And then do we have a number of violations that would put them in uh, risk of losing their license if they violate the good neighbor? Like some, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, might be an own, uh, owner that lives here in Teller County owns a property yeah, here, you know, and they can't can respond, but somebody complained and now they have a complaint. You know, how many complaints does it take? One? Does it take 10? No complaints, but a violation. And to, to your point, um, I have um, maybe sent out 10 letters total in the past six years. And every single time it says, you know, you're going you're gonna come to the, come to the hearing, you violated every single time the person comes in the next day. They don't want to lose this license. It's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then they come in the next day and they, and they fix it. Okay. But to your point, not it's not just a complaint; it's a violation. So, so someone marked down some. Well, it should have been clear and said violation. So if they violated the good neighbor policy. Somebody, one of their uh, tenants, did that during their short term rental period. Um, you know, I wondered what was you know, one incursion maybe is not enough to take their business license away, but Correct. if you're a multiple offender. Correct, but I would so, recommend to maybe put- Maybe that should be in there clearly that if it happens so often in so much time, there's no then you're at risk. In those places. So 
I would recommend from a practical standpoint that when this comes up, it's going to be that one egregious thing that you have the one violation for and you want to bring them in front of you. Okay. It, we, we don't have this. Yeah, we don't have this. I, I, I totally understand. Yeah. Okay. And, and I just know from yeah, just some experience, like I said, you bring them in first. And and, and I think we all, it, it, um, this this city probably is the same thing like a code enforcement. You do you could do a warning, yada, yada. But um, I have mine marked up on the... Uh, violations so it says uh, you if you want to renew there have been no violations i i put in there no unresolved violations Fair on, enough. on both of those because it seems that violations are going to happen right but That's the owner meant. will you resolve them and yeah. then they should be able to continue it, it's just going to happen there's no way you can say every short-term rental is not going to have one violation but they may be the best short-term rental place to stay in all of woodland park right that's so the account. It's unresolved. Or might, might we say so that's simple to, significant simple to put in. repeated violations yeah. because otherwise somebody says, well, I've been doing it all year long, but I stopped it today on my, the day of my renewal. And it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's why it's written. That's, yeah. And so Lee, that's, that's why some, some, right. some language, it just it's says they, yeah. they're resolved. Significant and, and repeated violations. We, yeah. That's or where that repeated. accountability component's built in because yeah. they have to be accountable. Otherwise, right. their business goes away and that revenue goes away. That's the biggest incentive. It's the revenue they're going to lose without the license. Yeah. So I'm saying that in a specific period of time, if in one year, since that's the term of the license, you have had this many violations, then you are not eligible. And it should say that. It could be added. You know what I mean? Something to that effect. And not, not to be, you know, because like you said, everyone's going to eventually somebody's going to have a bad, you know, experience there. And that's going to happen. And you don't want to pull their business license for that or or you know whatever but if they're a, a repeat offender that's allowing this to go on then there should be a provision that says if you have this many you reach whatever that is then you will get it with you will not get it renewed you know you'll continue throughout the year but you will not get it renewed and and then you can't renew it for a one or two year period so they can apply again in one or two years if there's any if they have any, if, if there's they any have vacancies. had this yeah if there's yeah. vacancies yeah. um you know where I'm going with this. So it's just as a matter of typos and stuff, um, you reference business license as the item to be displayed in some places. You call it permit in others. Probably should use the same language. Yes, yeah, we just want to again start. And on your definition, section three and section four, you have rental business um, um, unit for the section four, but you call it the short term rental business instead of unit. The first one's short term rental business, the second one's short term rental unit. You use business in both paragraphs. So just a couple of corrections. Nina, so, did you create the license standards and review criteria? Was that was that you who did that or was that the staff? Who did I that? only did the ordinance. So if is if if is um is that an ordinance itself? Okay. So what's your what's your thinking? Sorry to drill back on this, but what's your thinking on this no meal shall be prepared thing? I, uh, and to clarify, I plagiarized this most okay. part, but anyway, <laughs> um, so that was uh, <clears throat> the bed and breakfast thing. Like that's what separates this from a bed and breakfast. So it's like your, you know, bed and breakfast are in commercial zones. They're they're taxed differently. They're they're bed and breakfasts. They're so listed in the code. <laughs> a short term <laughs> rental that serves breakfast is a bed and breakfast. Well, and there's a host there to make it for you. If Whereas in a short term rental, there's no one there but you. Well, Unless it's if you're a private homeowner, though, when you do that, Unless it's talked about. if you go back to the initial, the initial <laughs> right. intent of an Airbnb was, you know, uh, come and sleep on the air mattress in my living room and I'll make you breakfast. <laughs> yeah, but like Airbnb, all things, that definition has kind of changed if now. Not, if, you're not licensing, if we don't put those, we don't the code, those people, that's not that doesn't apply to them. Covered or applied. Okay, I got you. Yeah. All right. You know, I got a question that's on page six of the ordinance, section seven. That seems like it's kind of out of place. It doesn't really reference any code section. It's purposeful. So that's if you guys put a cap. Um, it's not, again, we don't use the word grandfather for business license, but it's kind of saying, you, it, it sounds like if you all do a cap, you want to make sure that the first people to come in are those who already have a business license for short-term rental, like the people who exist right now. Mm -hmm. Those people would need to get get their application within the first week to kind of be considered for the short-term rental license, but it shouldn't be in the ordinance because it's just for a temporary situation. Okay, well, I recommend that we move it over to another section. But then it would be in the ordinance. I mean, it would be in the code. This is just, this is purposefully not in the code. Oh, okay. Section seven is purposely not in the code because it's just for like a, like a, for the first few weeks of, of the implementation of the, or, of the ordinance. So you're just trying to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Because people are concerned about that, but yeah. Okay. 
So with regards to back to the violation uh, conversation, um, just a thought from being in that role before is that, that that operations and that implementation and the management of that is a function of staff. Staff uses good judgment in making decisions all the time with working with taxpayers and license holders. So, and, and then council is always there as an appeal process. If they feel like they've been treated unfairly or unjustly, they can always come before the council and ask for the council to make a decision over and above what this decision of the staff was. So it kind of works nicely that way so that there's a balance of power. And I don't know if that's the right word, but that's how implementation has always been, even with the sales tax coach. Um, or, or you all also have the municipal court to help as well. So you have those avenues to, for appeal um, in the event that um, staff may be unreasonable in the eyes of the- That's why I'd like to see that, you know, hard thing in there that says, if you have this many violations, um, you know, within that specific, whatever. But I would leave that is. in the hands of staff, in my opinion. Well, I think, I think the language that I was either Larry or kind of suggested by saying no unresolved, I think that's a good starting point rather than just leaving it open. So no unresolved violations. So, cause that gives staff dis discrepancy. So I, I'm concerned about this because this is what the residents that I've heard from were concerned about is the disruption of their uh, residential area. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't say that and it's just unresolved, well, they could come apply for their business license again and have 20 violations and it wouldn't matter. Um, I'd rather them have it, rather say that there's got, you know, if you have multiple violations, in this period, then you will lose your license. Um, it can be revoked or it could be suspended. And then if it does, because they had that number of violations in that time period um, and staff is doing, you know, uh, following the policy and they don't like the policy and they are asking, um, you know, to retain their license or get it renewed, then that's when they would come to council and state their case. Otherwise, I mean, they could continue to apply for licenses and never have suspension if they've, if it's, you know, resolved. So can I make a suggestion? Um, I, I took those notes. I think um, it's, I think we all want guide, like guidance on the, on the larger policy issues, like the caps, the primary residence, the, um, all that before it goes to planning commission. So if we go to the, cause that was actually what I was going to bring up next was to try to get to the cap. If we're not going to require STR owners or owner occupied STR licenses, then should we reduce the percentage of the cap from 6%? But I mean, we the problem is we don't know. So I don't know if we just go with a lower number to start with, like Kelly said, and if we need to go higher, we higher. go higher. No, no lower, we start with lower. A lower right. You start mm -hmm. with a lower number. And if it's not enough, then we come back and raise it to six percent anecdotally, anecdotally just the past couple of years very few people fit into the situation unfortunately that um, Councilor Zulaga said um I, I think I, we could check quickly but in terms of like just renting their room out it's not okay all right unfortunately it started that way but we could still if you go to like Kelly said if we start out with a more strict number and it turns out that it's not enough we can always raise the number yeah I think what Nina, I think what Nina is asking though is do we in fact want a cap what what that cap is or right yeah. right which and, was and what i would I was say trying. yes i'd say yes yes i mean i think we all want a cap and then i guess we go to the question of do we want the cap plus the density cap the or density is an enforcement nice yeah, thing yeah, it's really hard yeah, that yeah an i agree i agree an but example it was... would be um as a real estate agent and i have a client that wants to buy this house on this block and there's already one on that block, but I don't know that. I would not place that trust in the hands of a real estate agent to make that determine because that's who's going to have to look into it before they sell that property. And then they, if they close on that property and then they come in and they're like, oh, you can't have a license because there's already one on that block. That's not a good situation. No, but you could also go back to your buyer beware. It well, it is more. absolutely. So I'm Kelly, just sure Kelly, I'm just putting we, it out there. I understand. Didn't we have that guy send us an email just last week, week before, or whatever? I think you all got it. He says, I didn't know you guys were doing any of this, and I spent all my money to buy these 
Uh, I mean, isn't that part of that a buyer beware? Isn't that like not our responsibility to to uh, but can I just say one thing? Well, because when you apply for a What's business that? license, I spoke to me, did a check. When you apply for a business license, you should go to planning and check to ensure that that business is allowed at that address. I agree. So I'm, I'm, you know, we've got 158 of them who haven't done that. So that's why our zoning is where it is now. Because if you, if finally everybody up here has agreed that it's called lodging, <laughs> you know, so it, it's taken a long time to do that. And I appreciate that. But please understand that this is a detriment to our city, allowing these short-term rentals. It is not good for our city. It's not good for our schools, not good for our teachers, or our police officers. It is a nightmare. And I would say the density That's thing is, is important to universal. address because if, and I'm looking at this from the you know perspective of residents not happy with some of them in their neighborhood or living right next to it, because a lot of people may not care until they have to live next to one and it bothers them. So if you've got three of them, now you have three of them next to you. And you you've know, lost so you've lost those and now, in your neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe they're trying to sell their house and they know to find out those are three STRs across from them or five or however many since they can buy what they want. Um, you know, that may lower their property value because people aren't going to want to move in next to it. So what I'm hearing is That's you do want both dozens of lower property percentage. I just like to no I just like to get some feedback on it. You know, like I sure. think it should be at least considered. Yeah. You understand for planning commission viewpoint, we're interested in hearing on these points. And if not a formal votes, at least see how many heads are nodding. I think I may have heard four, seen four nods maybe on that. I'm not quite sure. It was three and a half at least. But it's, it's helpful to us to get your, your input on it. Well, I also have a concern about enforcement on density with, with are, are we hiring a full-time staff member now? Are they the ones that are going to be watching these addresses? Like, how are we, right. you know, the, I, I'm not against a cap, but I think me personally, this is just me personally, if you're gonna do a cap, do a general cap. If you wanna, if you wanna do restrictions on caps, do owner occupied versus non-owner occupied restrictions, but to try to break it all the way down to a specific neighborhood and a specific block, who is watching this? Well, and currently, no, right. tax so money is going to towards that. beautification because, of the city. Because they're the ones responsible for enforcing this. There not is no us, money going to enforcement. Well, if, the idea of keeping these out of certain residential areas, is there any reason to cap them if they're in a commercial area? I don't see why we would cap them in a commercial area. That's I wouldn't see why we would either. It's designed for right. So I, I understand the cap. Maybe this should be applied to the zone. And but so residential areas. Then maybe people would say, "I want to build short-term rentals in the park because there's a huge market for it, and people want to come and stay there and visit, spend money, and does not be a detriment to Woodland Park. Maybe it need to be a commercial property." Yeah, I think we all want more hotel space or something or lodging, so maybe we look at it that way as well. So our, our Title right? 18 covers uh, short-term lodging in commercial areas. That's already in place. Doesn't have to say anything in our short-term rental ordinance about that. No, it's a, a lodging is allowed in all of our commercial districts. So they, but so, if it's a residential so, unit, we would, they would, I would say that they have to go yeah, towards yes. um, the licensing. Right, Michael, yeah, go and, ahead. And going back to the mayor's so, question, yeah, well, I think we're saying the same thing. But, but maybe the cap wouldn't apply to commercial short-term rentals. Is that what most people feel? This sounds like expanding Karen's crazy idea. Yeah, yeah. Saying, you know, overlay more available. Put them in commercial areas. It's sort of the same, similar idea. Put them, right. 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 Put them on top of pizza parlors. Let, let me well, let Michael. Uh, Michael wanted to say something, so I'm going to go ahead and let him go first. So going back to the mayor's question about the, the buffer and how, how does that look administration wise um, in our draft, uh, our guidelines here, is that what these are application? Uh, it does need to go. You would need to go through planning in order to make sure that your license is valid. And we would a density analysis would create that extra step. We would need to have someone who does that. That takes time to do that. Something else to keep in mind too is that already with the existing license business licenses, there are clusters of these things together tightly compacted in a neighborhood. So you would have to consider how a buffer might impact those folks. Now, so, there are some units, multi-family units out there in which several of those units or all those units in that structure are already short-term rentals. Right. And so that, that adds an additional layer of complexity that you're gonna have to consider and that's a difficult one. I'm not, I, I don't know how best to handle that. Well, you know, Michael, on that issue, when there's multiple in a 
multifamily home situation like an apartment building and there's that many units in there well that's what a hotel is so i see that as a very different thing yeah. well this code currently prohibits in, in apartment buildings and multifamily yeah, and there, there are just a handful of them out there but they are out there they're already so I'm not, I'm not disagreeing by any means it's just it's something that would you'd all want to be considering on the yeah. property and aren't they zone com com commercial multifamily is zone commercial there, there's no. i think there's 11 no. units and then multifamily zone trail ridge is not zoned commercial no what are those multifamily. rentals? Multifamily. Those, those, are those are apartments. Yeah. We're, we're talking about multi, That's right. yeah, multifamily urban locations. Urban. There, there are 11 in those. There are okay. 11 in our multifamily zones. Okay. There's the others that we talked about that are taxed. That's a whole other issue, yes. There's just one pet peeve I have is oh, right. legislating something that we cannot enforce. Sure, it's right. a waste of time. I mean, we can enforce it if there's a fee that is tacked on to right. uh, have that FTE to do that. Well, and that's where that license fee yeah, and for the these voters SDR voted for that, And the voters would, voted to get for beautification for the city. That's where that dollar goes to. It does not go to enforce. This would come from the license fee for the short-term rental license. And it would need to the analysis done to set that at a level that would pay for itself. Right. 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 Or at least nearly pay for itself, come really close. And we have the ability to adjust that as time goes and inflationary pressure or whatever that might be. And understand that, that no matter if the more deep we dive, the more expensive in staff time that we're going to have to have a person that does that. And that comes with salary and benefits and all of the that that comes with that and software and to in order to uh, properly enforce something that we've put in place so that that's a consideration that i think we really have to take into account here because it's it's you're looking at approaching 100 grand and so and so we would need to set the license level. I mean, we're talking $500 or above. Now, understanding that the, the revenue stream of that business venture certainly supports a higher fee um, and, and is, I think, appropriate. But that's an, that's an analysis that the, that the staff would have to bring back to us um, to set that level. But that's just something to take in consideration. The, the more regulation, the more expensive. Is that what the fee's looking at now? Five hundred dollars? Is that what we're? I don't know. I just no, made that up. Made that. You could almost mathematically guess. It would be it's up like in that, that area. I, I, it's I up would, in that place. It, it depends on what you're, what you want to do in uh, enforcement With wise. Enforcement, if you are looking exactly. at city inspections, yes, um, you okay. would be. It would probably be in the. Eight hundred to a thousand dollar annual range. Yeah, Robert, and I, and I look at the, I, that's over to me. That's overkill. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but you know, uh, control control it, uh, self regulate it, and uh, have at the least amount of onerous protect neighbors like Frank's clearly got a concern about. But you know, gee, we just don't want to create another level of bureaucracy in my mind. I don't know what he so say. If, so I think we have a good start. Yeah. So if we're going back to the density issue, you're saying that I have no interest in that. I know you don't, but um, <laughs> um, you would have either way the the business license has to go to planning. So right. That's ridiculous. Is that so the way we set this up? That, that's what I'm trying for us. How you're setting this up? So the way we, we set it up for the application comes into finance. Finance says, okay, you know. Hey, they paid for it. Like I put it in here. It's like finance says, hey, here's everything. The packet's complete. They paid for it. It goes to planning. Definitely. Planning looks at it and says, hey, where are they? So that goes back to, like you said, like it took a long time to go through 180 yeah. places and figure out where each. hundred Like took a while to go through to figure out which zone each of these in is in. So when the application comes in, Planning stamps that, hey, it's in this zone. So now we keep track of it for, for the future. And then they look at, hey, are there any caps? That, and does it fit in with that cap? Is it a you know, number cap or is it a density cap? And that's as simple as like looking at it on GIS. Here's the property. The next closest 
property is a mile away or 500 feet away or, or whatever, or putting a string around it. And it's like, hey, it's, it's clear. Could, um, could I suggest we do the planning thing before we pay? <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, do we that can. now with home occupation permits. It's just a routing, right? Uh, just like we do with planning applicants. We route that through a series of people to review so that compliance is there. Yeah, we don't do that now. Do we? we did not with business licenses, but home occupation, yes. I, I guess my angst is if we're already going through planning and we're not doing 180 at one time now, right? We're going to add-ons add-ons right so is it that much more to have them spend the time to go figure out what zone they're in so that you don't have six right next to one another well i would say that i heard uh karen mention i think 76 or seven times uh about three council sessions ago that she doesn't have enough staff well i know that so, david <laughs> you know that i'm just saying so I think we should look at the density thing and we should look at what the cost would actually be to have the FTE to handle that. And then who does that? Right. Is that someone in the planning department that we add an FTE to the planning department who That's assists Karen decision. and then does this, which I think that might be a good idea. That's a way to help your planning department out as well. But yeah. I think that's something we have to have more information on. I just want to consider it. Yeah. And you also could charge more. It sounds like there'll be a higher, a higher charge for the first application for some they come in right because the second time can't you they come in you already know where they are located so some places have a certain fee for the first application and then a renewal is cheaper but you want to make sure it does cover costs because otherwise the rest of your taxpayers are, are paying yes. the burden yeah correct correct right right so you have to be willing to set a license fee that's if the, the stricter you want to get and the more work you create the higher that license fee is going to need to be, and we're going to need to be willing to put an employee in the budget. And if you are not willing to consider that, please don't talk about further restrictions. Correct. That's that, that that's all I can tell you is the, the stricter you want to get, the more money it's going to cost. So think about that and be willing to either set the fee high and cover it in the budget or Shut up. <laughs> like, serious. Hillary, just say how you so, really feel. <laughs> and the other thing is, we still we still have all this list of things to consider that Rob gave us. Yeah, We've no, touched no. some of them, but that was really kind of why we were here also, is they needed these things to get wrapped up. And we have about half an hour to do that. And I feel like we're not settled necessarily. I don't think they have real concrete direction to really get this formatted out. You still had a concern about how many violations can there be? No one backed you, no one gave a number. There was no anything on that. So I don't know if you would like to ask staff to come up with a, if there's a city that has an example yeah, of that. Yeah, I took notes of that. I think, uh, and then that's something okay. that you guys could easily like look over when you get it. I, I think more we need the, to your point, those main, like, yeah. um, if you don't mind there, thank you. Right. So, and the, so density, do we have any kind of cohesive, I know planning, they've got a suggestion, they can make it stricter, they know how to do it. Do you want that to be considered by density and an overall cap, or do you want just an overall cap? Is there any kind of consensus on that yet? Before you answer um, that question, let me, let me give you my, my, my take on that. Please. I think that the density cap the separation between units is one of the strongest provisions to protect existing neighborhoods. That is a very critical part of not having them all cluttered, not all concentrated in one area. Separation is very important. Yeah. I'd like to add that if we're at 5.9 percent and we set the cap at 6 percent without density, we've still accomplished the same thing because there's no additional STRs going in till somebody moves out anyway. So it may be a first step is we just have the cap tight like it is now, but it depends on how you wanna enforce it. But if we take the owner occupied out, then that number is gonna go down. Remember we've, we've kind of come, I think to consensus. That's possibility as well, yeah. so. Yeah. And I also heard our attorney say that's not a significant number. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Ken, if if that's the case, the question just then the is- the what's one, Renting one room is not a significant Right, yeah. that's, what, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, or, or Larry, um, so if you've got 
already a cluster in neighborhoods, what's causing angst now. And you just cap it and that solves it. You haven't solved that problem. Then you'd still have the issue of grandfathering or not grandfathering people who are all clustered in the same area like they are. Now, how, you know, and I don't know what that number is. Do you know, Rob, what the number is of clustered? Well, we can't well, actually grandfather anybody because we don't have any ordinances to grandfather them into. Well, true enough. Plus, they apply for a license every year. So I had, right. I yeah, had. But if they've got the license already, what I'm saying, and they're but they they're but they don't. But they they don't. Wait, wait. You, right? No one has a license yet. Right. right. They have a business license. We are now creating a whole other oh, okay. bureaucracy. So, so there's no way to grandfather in someone on something they do not have. I would propose that if you have a cluster of STRs that pre-exist and they meet the guidelines that we've set forth in this ordinance and the good neighbor policy. They don't have a ton of violations. They don't have a ton of complaints and issues and they come in and apply for a license. Nothing would flag them to not get that license. However, if it's not a good neighbor situation, which is the ones that the neighbors would have an issue with, that would be a reportable opportunity that would get them considered to not get their license renewed. Can I, and that would be taking care of itself through that means rather than completely agree wait, with what trying to regulate on, it out let, of let, let Nina Actually, clarify this argument. Yeah. Right? So section that's seven of the ordinance, on um, which I know I think Larry asked about earlier, it's not in the code that's purposeful. Right. And this is for if you guys put a cap, a person with a current business license that does short term rental business, they're going to be um, processed first, but they need to actually fill out the whole application and submit it. So that deals with the whole issue of, you know, if they are already existing. They'll, they'll get in line first, but right. they are not grandfathered in no, to what they are doing. No. Correct. Correct. Ken, can I say something for a second? I agree with 100% with what you said about the density. And Larry, you were talking about, should we have the density? You're going to have to in the planning commission, when you write up your proposal to us, explain how you would do it if you do something other than what Ken is saying. Because if they're following the good neighbor policy, where's the angst? I mean, I don't want a bunch of bureaucracy that we can't enforce. And why are you doing a density if they're following the good neighbor? So just explain why you would want to do it, but please consider what Ken pointed out abeyance of good neighbor you don't have a density thing it's understood so does staff feel like you have can we pull up those other bullet points is there any way to go back to the yeah do you feel like you have direction with with the the cap at all you guys had a cap. I don't know what the percentage would be. And I, it sounds like the majority of you said residential in the residential zones. But what is the 6%? What, what number this is that? right here. Well, I, mean, I mean, isn't the average in the state of like 3%? Yeah, but that, and right average. now, that 6% is 180, right? right yeah, so we're looking at every percent is about 30 short-term rentals. Okay. That's, thank you. I just, Rest, Rusty, go ahead. Yeah, it, to the cap thing, because I'm listening to number. a lot of comments. Yeah. I would ask, because we're trying to get a consensus, that when you're considering caps, could you please look at differentiating between owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied, which is something, Robert, you, and then what Kelly pointed out, resident-owned versus non-resident-owned. They're different. No, they are very, very different. So I'm just, look at those two terms, and uh, just to clarify, Robert only spoke to if they're renting the room out. There's a lot of people who could rent their whole house in their primary residence, and they should still get a short-term rental I, license. I understand. Yes. You know, okay. That's what I'm saying. Just in your cap analysis, an owner-occupied versus non-owner, and then a resident-owned versus a non-resident-owned. So that non-resident-owned or resident-owned, please consider EINs and SS and, you know, businesses versus people. And Buena Vista trust, does that. Trust, people don't do that. I took that line of trust. from Buena Vista. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I recognize that. Don't yeah. we have a, uh, uh, we don't have a, like a 500 foot buffer or it, in that It in was there? mentioned and that's why we want direction. I, I thought if we did something like that, you wouldn't have to worry about a cap. 
because uh, you wouldn't have to worry about a density cap because uh, you could spread it out just by virtue of distance. It's more, than, regardless that, it's more than that, Frank. It's right. more than just 500 foot separation. And regardless, well, I mean, I, it's just, I just throwing that out there, right? But regardless, you still have the cluster problem that you already have. What are you gonna do? Tell this other person they gotta move? Well, eventually those the licenses are gonna expire, the properties get transferred. And so the density would then gradually spread out. It may not be the it first 10 years, years right? but yes. 20, right. 30 years, you know, you're gonna have more dispersed around the city. And I think we need to look at the long range planning. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah, because if, if somebody does lose their license or somebody just stops operating it, then you could say that that property now can't be, it's gotta be within the density, you know, and you don't have to make the current people as long as they hold their license. So I know we talked about grandfathering, right? But um, that they, they don't do that, but we could have that stipulation that now we're not gonna tell you you can't and you still get in line. We, and we could have that since we are, we are changing the rules here, we could have it instead of saying you're first come first sir, or you guys get to come you know, get in line first. We could say, you know, you have two weeks or 30 days or whatever for all existing, if we choose to go with a cap that accepts that, um, to go ahead and let them, you know, guarantee reapply. So we're not putting anybody out. So, so, section seven, yeah. so we're asking Nina then to include both a discussion of a percentage cap, a density cap, and a zone cap, all three numbers to be determined. I think, isn't the zone cap though only going to be for the residential I heard area? from that you, most of you. Residential, residential only. Yeah. Okay. And yes. the buffer. When you guys say dot density, you mean 500 foot buffer? That's what you mean by density? We, we can look at uh, the density, whatever the dimension is. 500 feet is enough, right? And what do you in, guys in think? In urban know. residential houses are 30 feet apart, so. So it could be different for yeah, urban versus suburban. So, and yeah. suburban yeah. residential could be up to a, an acre apart, so. So just a placeholder for her to, right. to include in the so. new draft. And then do, uh, do a, a consensus of you agree that beyond the cap, you should have an exception for prior residency or not? No. I don't know. I think we should. I think an exception so, for yeah, what? We don't, we don't know yet. Like, like you said, beyond I the think cap. We need to get for residency? For, for a primary resident. Right. Versus, um, okay. Well, I'll occupy. Okay. I think that was Rusty's. Yeah. Owner occupied. Owner occupied. Remember, the owner occupied. Part with just a room out, it seemed to be they don't need a permit. So that owner should, occupied that's renting the whole house out because they're going to Florida for six months. They would be different, but, but they don't get right. capped because it's their house. Right. They don't, Is that so, what I hear? That, that, that's, uh, that's tough. Mm, I are we saying that? I don't that's think I have one. a problem. That, that's that's a, are we saying that? The cap? And if so, maybe the lower the cap. <laughs> yeah, are we saying that? Yeah, we should change the cap it? number if that's the case. If you're renting your house. If you're renting your house out for six months, it's it's no longer it's no short term longer owner. You're not. It's also owner not owner short term. It's, it's oh, short term. Yeah, if it's longer than thirty yeah. days, it goes out of the short term. Maybe I shouldn't have said six months. All can I say all a historical all, all the short term rental ordinances yeah. that have primary residents yeah, right. that was because they wanted to <laughs> regulate them. Uh, that was their cap. So usually, you don't do. Um, yeah, I think we know. What do you what are you saying? So like um, when the, these these started to come out, there was no caps in the ordinance, like including Denver, and yeah. they instead of in, to self limit it, it was only primary residents. Right. Then um, the cap was put in for other communities who didn't have that primary residency. Primary residency is a restriction that helps cap in and of itself. Right, and that right. that was the when it comes down to non owner occupied and residential zones. I wanted to really only be for owners of Teller County could actually own an STR on Woodland Park, and so uh, that's a concept. Yeah, that's uh, that would limit quite a few things, and it would open up some of our housing, and I think that would be a prudent thing to do. Well, we do have people in El Paso as well who own up here. Or I'm not concerned yeah. about El Paso. People. Or well, Paso. I'm just saying we you know, do realize that you have to be in El Paso to have a short term rental. So they have their rules too. So, so what, was there some consensus my, on that? Something I didn't there's no consensus on it. There's a, I, I, well, that's the question. Yeah. So I didn't know. I just heard somebody talk about when you take owner occupied out of it, that's not part of the cap number. I, I don't think that should, I think it should be included in the number. Well, it should. I, I think, think it should okay, be. Okay, but the owner occupied of the full building, not 
Oh, that's a full building. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 we, yeah. We've already set aside the people who are doing it. And it's like five. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I, a lot of people yeah. running around. So some, those, sure. those people are not included in yeah, this at all. But, but, but in terms of, of somebody who, who rents a place for six months, who goes out of town for six months, they are part of the cap. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in my opinion. Only, only if it's short term rentals during that six months. If they rent it for six months, that's a long term rental. Oh, well, oh, that's a different, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. And if we're talking about enforcement, it's much easier to have a cap than the, um, the places that I work for that have the primary residency, like I'm always talking to the people and like, you know, we're like kind of threatening them if they have looking at their voter registration and because people try to be clever. So just think of that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are trying to be clever. So when I hear we are actually defining what an applicant is. Yes. By this, by this information, by either non owner occupied or owner occupied. So we need to be very careful on how we. To find them. Well, that's yeah. That's why Rusty wanted to get that information to yeah. find out yeah, what we're actually looking at with that. Those, it's hard to decide if you what yeah. cap you want to have if you don't even know what you're looking at and how you're going to define that. First, yeah. you need to know what you even got, what you have. You exactly know? to David's point. I, I'm not but saying cap it or not cap it. Just if you we don't have pull that them data. apart and then you toy around we with numbers. We don't your judgment on that. We don't know who are owner occupied or non owner occupied. We don't have that data right now. In the how, do, how do we get that? Oh, going forward. Oh, going sure forward. Thing we're doing this for the sure. Yeah. Rob, how do we get that sure. data? So yeah, we can like that's what we talked about changing the process of the application, and we'll have that data in the future. We're right. going back, short of figuring out how to contact every STR license owner right now. Right. There's no way of doing it. But Rob, can you see how many people who have applied to have a Woodland Park address? Sometimes, but they're very. They have to get their address right when they apply for a business license. Sometimes <laughs> that's like that's why I have like those eighteen and I can't even Sometimes. find because like right. addresses the the they, process they is really kind of messed up so addresses are in the wrong places and and tying them down is difficult to know the where exactly not filled out. So guys, yes, we have we, we have twenty minutes left and there's still like twelve topics on here that we haven't covered. So like we haven't covered certificate of occupancy requirements, limiting the number of licenses that a single person can have, liability insurance. Um, there's a number of things we haven't looked at or talked about yet. Liability insurance is, goes without saying. Well, yeah, but. And so, I would say you don't need a, the CO is irrelevant because of my definition. I, I, it's not a residential dwelling unit unless it has a CO. No, you changed the definition to a business. No, it's privately owned residential dwelling unit. Yeah. As opposed to somebody who has a lot and they come in right. and ask for a license. They couldn't, yeah. So there is no need to, right. There's right. No need for a I got that. That's why I wrote, it's everything I wrote is purposeful. <laughs> So are we going to talk about primary residence and being able to have an SCR, having a voter registration card, Colorado license? I think we've been talking so we have about that for a long time. We have a consensus. We don't have that. to decide how, whether it's a Colorado license. Yet. It's a primary resident, the process of doing the application, you decide what evidence you need. I don't think we don't have to, I don't think we don't say the words. She what knows what I needs. Think the I, I, I do know, that's fine. Does that does know. I, I, don't, I don't hear a consensus that um, you want to do anything with the primary residency because you'd, you'd put in an ordinance only if you're going to restrict it only to primary residents or make some kind of exception. And I haven't heard a consensus. But what do we do with all the STR owners who aren't primary residents? That's I'm curious about that myself. The licenses get new when we finish this. So everybody's on the same footing. Everybody gets a chance. We're not taking away anybody's home. They're still homeowners. This is just regulating businesses within our neighborhoods. That's exactly what this is. I'm unconcerned about anybody else other than our current residents now in our city. That's or you can do something for the future. I'm like, thinking all the current the property future. owners in our city. Right. I am who don't live here. percent If you live in Teller County, you should be allowed to have a short term rental because our police chief and our sheriff are going to know who to go to. So this goes all the way back to the cap discussion. So we're still on that topic. We can't get past because we can't get past it. So <laughs> maybe I could break it down to like options. If you only want a cap in residential, 
you know, let me just go through a few ideas. Um, a cap just for residential zone is what I'm hearing. When we say primary residency, I haven't heard any direction as to why that's relevant unless a consensus of you tell me that either all license or all licenses, all, all licenses that don't have licenses right now in the future are going to be primary residents of the county. And it's I'm, like, I'm why are we bringing, I think the I'm relevancy, why, why so, that differentiation? Well, I think the relevancy um, that Frank's talking about with this is that the sheriff and the police chief know who to go to, right? But the truth is we have a good neighbor. That's why I asked this question earlier. There's an agreement that they sign that if they violate that, they can have their license suspended or revoked, right? And so it doesn't really matter contact. where they're from. They, they have, have to follow the rules. Right. Person right. The right, so I'm trying to yeah. figure out if a I mean, majority do even want that to be in the code for any reason. And that would restrict your people that may live here three months out of the year and rent it the rest of the time. So no, as long as they're that's following- longer than 30 days. Well, the STR, no, unless they're doing right. STRs. Yeah, yeah. So if they like live down south or somewhere else, they live in they're Canada and they come here and they, mm -hmm. you know, live here for a few months of the year and then they rent it the rest of the time. That's over thirty days. Um, then yeah, they'd be part of the cap. Well, I, they, I think what Nina's trying to determine. There's one one individual on the dais that says nobody but people who live in Teller County and own property in Teller County should be eligible to have an STR license. But there are others that are saying, you know, if you live in- you My live neighbor in, built a house that lives across the street from me. He lived there his whole life, but he has only lived there three months out of the year, the last 10 years, because right. he has another residence- Well, what is the planning commission Someplace think about else. That? And it's not mutually exclusive. It so, could just be- um, I don't see why license. we would penalize him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, not sure hey, why we're restricting we discuss... out of county people from owning property here. Right. I don't. Well, they can own it. They just couldn't use it as an STR for Frank. Why are we Frank. limiting that? Why are we saying that? I, I don't think we should. I think there's a there's a good because you usually do it to limit. But if you're gonna have a cap, then that's another way to limit it. Right. It's like right. what kind of could be one or the other, right? And then we wait for the constitutional challenge to come eventually. I don't think. So. Yeah. Why are we discriminating against their <laughs> out of the owned that property for years versus somebody who? Right. Yeah, I think it's simpler to have buy a cap. it tomorrow and rent it. It's that's getting into too many just a general that we would have to consider. Um, yeah. I think just the to cap general serve cap. the purpose that we're looking for. And, and Nina so can the code with a good neighbor and yeah, act and all I agree. And there and everything. So I agree. Can I give the rationale why I asked for sure. that? Just so you can consider. And then before you do it, let, let me just let everyone know. Now we're getting close to starting council. So we've got the cap issue covered. We're gonna have to have another work session to get mm -hmm. the rest of these covered, I think, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Can Anyways, do it, please for the next meeting, can we make a special meeting so that we can get on with this? I'm not real interested in continuing the moratorium if we can avoid it at all costs. So if right. we can make so arrangements yeah, to have I a special meeting together, moratorium. that'd be great. It's not the end of the so let, let me let Rusty get back to his question and then we'll circle back to how we're going to wrap this up. And for clarity, it's not a question. It's, it's I mean, an explanation it? why that categorization, because I heard Robert's concern about corporations coming in buying up large tracks. You can, if you want to put a cap on non resident owned, you limit what the corporations can come in and buy. If you take a resident owned and it's not capped or it has a much higher cap, whatever you want to look at, it's a way of controlling the culture not being poisoned by. Big corporations coming well, in and I think taking Nina over. has that because she yeah. said she has the Buena Vista model. Well, mm -hmm. Buena Vista yes. model addresses and that exactly. Play, yeah. Well, she, yes. you asked the question, you know, why? Because so it, it's it. like, do you guys just want to live by cap or do you want to do it by residency or both? It's like kind of. It's a matrix of it's a two by two matrix because you see it both yeah. ways. Yeah. So you can you can that. always find in when the, a business registers with the Secretary of State's office, there is a registered agent. Mm -hmm. on there for every business so uh, that registered agent should be the one that can be contact for issues with that business there's contact information i register my business every year and it doesn't matter whether you're a corporation you're the marriott you're I think whomever you've changed you are. the topic yeah, but to nina's point she but just I'm wants to know saying want, there's still yeah, a I she just nina just wants to know if we want to go with the cap or do we want to go the rest of the and or i think it's general cap. cap and i say a cap cap so, cap. 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 so then it's irrelevant as the residency cap 
Yes. But I think the consensus just so said out loud, I think is capped. That's so, right. Frank, did you but, say And remember, yeah. just, just quickly to remember, whatever we're doing here can be changed. Right. We can right. evolve all of this over time because right. we're going to learn things. We're going to discover stuff, you know? So if we need to suddenly cap with residential only or what have you, we'll get that figured out. But this is just a starting point to, to get going. As of now, I hear percentage cap for residential zones. Yes. yes. And, and just because we've had three of these joint work sessions by now, and we are under the moratorium, and I know that's creative angst for some people. Yes. Um, I would I propose we draft this as Nina has, Nina understands it. And, and take it to the planning commission probably this would have said september 8th time frame and Is then if you want to wrap up you guys could adjourn yeah. your maybe, meeting maybe start at 7 15 answer. but i think it's good to get i feel like you're gonna always fill the vacuum but it's up to you guys so to you all. i i think it will take them longer than that to yeah and to i don't want to see an ordinance that we've agreed i saw one tonight it was a good width and i haven't had enough time to talk about it i guess what i'd recommend is let, let us, the Planning Commission, work some of these things out. We heard a lot of the issues tonight. I like that. Yeah. And, and prior to conducting the public hearing for that process, we'll come back to you and say, here's a draft regulation. We think we've addressed these things. Can I like that. This? I think that's a great idea. I, don't I like that. Sure that's that. that's your job. Uh, and I'm going to amend based on like a consensus that I got to give in front of Planning Commission, right? That's what I was going to do. And that's really the role of Planning Commission, actually. Yeah. Right, but I just so the public and council's aware, we October sixth is when the moratorium ends. We'll have so, to extend it by October sixth. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to extend it by then if we cannot get this resolved prior to that. So I just want to give the public a heads up. We are aware of the date, and we. Well, the moratorium yeah. is really all it's doing is freezing things. Right. Yes. So, right. you know, the, the fact that we have to freeze it for another three months is not the end of the world. No, it is for right. some people. It is for some people. Yeah, absolutely. But They're losing money every day. You know, the quicker they, we they can either have a license now or, or they don't. Right. There's people that have no. bought property they were that are caught. waiting to start oh, with a, a license yes. they were caught in yeah. Yeah. and they're losing it could just be for one day. more month it doesn't have to be for three months yeah. right it doesn't have to be another three months no no it could be 30 so, days but i just want to remind all of yeah. you to keep that in mind Thank look you. this stuff over prior to any next work session or meeting you can always put suggestions in an email send them to suzanne so she can share with the rest of council and planning commission so everyone can look at them you can do feedback prior so <laughs> Yeah, it's not quasi judicial. So, all right. So, with that, we're going to end this work session. Planning Commission, thank you. I hope to hear your recommendations. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.